House needs painting. Grass needs mowing. Where's he at? Hi, this is Hank. Sorry I missed your call. Leave me your name and your number and I'll get back to you. He's gone fishing. Hello and welcome to Hank Parker Off the Water. Did I say that right, Sarah Beth? Off the Water with Hank Parker. I messed it up again. <laughs> I can never get that right. Welcome to Off the Water with Hank Parker. And I have my beautiful co-host, Sarah Beth. Hello. Who happens to be my granddaughter and my boss. And uh, she takes care of me. And so I appreciate that. I need all the help I can get in my old age. You sure do. <laughs> <laughs> it's she a chore. would agree with that. Hey, today our topic is summertime bass fishing, summertime fishing in general. So we're going to be talking about that. But before we get into that, Sarah Beth has a list of questions that we've had viewers. And let me tell you, we sure appreciate all the questions that we get. And I'll do my very best to get them all in and answer them. Uh, probably won't get them all, but we'll sure try. So. All right. Well, starting out with the first question from Carrie Faulkner. Did you fish and film a show in Tallahassee on Lake Jackson? How would you approach fishing North Florida today? Well, great question. You know, Jackson's a lake that goes dry and fills back up. It's an unusual lake, and uh, I have fished there. Summertime is what we're going to be talking about, and that is where they are at Lake Jackson right now in northern Florida. The spawn is over uh, for the most part and it's uh, it's summertime pattern so unlike a lake in the Carolinas where I grew up you don't have as much deep water option uh, however Lake Jackson's got some springs in it and those fish after that spawns over they love to gang up in those springs and uh, that's a good place to catch them at a spring head uh, also they they really uh, relate to grass lines they get on those uh, grass lines and maybe not bury up in the grass so much they're hard to catch when they do that but they get on the edges and uh, uh, early morning and late afternoon is obvious that's a good place to be but uh, uh, in the midday when it is bright hot even though it's shallow water they'll bury up in that grass and punching uh, using a big uh, ounce and a half tungsten weight, maybe even a two ounce to get through that real heavy grass is very, very productive. So that's, if I was approaching Lake Jackson today, I'd probably start off throwing some top water on those grass edges, and then I'd work my way down to maybe a soft plastic worm on those grass edges. And then as the sun gets more intense and brighter, I would probably go back and start punching that heavy grass. All right, next question. Samuel Schultz said, did the, chap did the Japanese folk ever find out about that computer reel? Did they ever try to come back? <laughs> well, let me go back and reiterate what that was all about for those of you that didn't, uh, uh, didn't see the last or hear the last podcast we did with the boys. Uh, we talked about my kids doing some uh, crazy things, and one of them was uh, Ben, uh, my third oldest son, I uh, had a Japanese computerized reel that uh, they came over from Tokyo for me to fish with, and uh, I had to go out of town, and so we didn't complete our task. And while I was gone, my son Ben flipped that rod and reel down to the to the lake in Lake Norman where we lived and fished off the dock, and a catfish pulled it in the lake. So that computerized reel stayed in the water for three days before I got back, or two days, and uh, by the time I got back and dried it out with a hairdryer and the, the, the gentleman from Tokyo came back to, uh, to analyze the reel with me, they couldn't get it to work. And no, I never told them. Maybe <laughs> I should have. That was wrong of me. But I was so uh, intimidated by that. But uh, that rod, I, I fished it out of the lake. Uh, the day before they came back and uh, dried it with a hairdryer. And I thought everything was going to be good, but uh, somehow it had a short, and when they plugged it in their computer, they never could get it to read, so I yeah. never fessed up. I'm sure when they got back to Tokyo and took it all apart, they realized. You lying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. I didn't lie. I just <laughs> didn't come forward with the truth. Uh, but no, I never fessed up. I was too embarrassed and too intimidated, so I just never 
messed up. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, next question. <laughs> That's this, not good. This is Rob Seward. What color pawpaw should I use in Alabama right now? Color pawpaw in Alabama. Uh, let me tell you, our pawpaw sales are going really well, and I'm going to do a little piece uh, that we'll put on Facebook on description on how to fish them, uh, what's different about them than most uh, other uh, lipless-type crankbaits. And uh, so I'll go into detail. I won't do that on the podcast because a lot of people, quite frankly, don't care. But for those who do care, I'll, I'll offer it, and you can uh, click on it and watch it and, and kind of discern the difference between it and other uh, lipless-type crankbaits. But uh, Alabama is no different than North Carolina or South Carolina or any other state. Uh, I would discern uh, uh, which bait to use by watercolor, and uh, uh, I always try to, to select my bait based on watercolor, match the hatch kind of a theory. And uh, so right now on Lake Murray, uh, we have a blue back heron uh, color pawpaw, and uh, the fish are chasing blue back heron big time, so obviously that's the color that I would choose if I were fishing Lake Murray. If I were in Alabama and they're feeding on threadfin shad, we have a shad colored. We have a, if it water's really, really clear, and some of the lakes, especially get in northern Alabama, uh, you get really clear water. Uh, I would probably select a transparent uh, Tennessee shad, a, a ghost Tennessee shad. Uh, so depends on the watercolor as to how I would select what color bait. Awesome. I think you covered that one. All right, next question is Gary Clark, uh, Tennessee. Will you and the boys be doing any fishing or hunting shows this year? Love to see that again. That is so nice. I appreciate that. Uh, and, yes, uh, we're going to New York. I got uh, Boone, Cade, my two, Hank Jr.'s two boys, and Hank Jr. himself, and we're going to be doing a little smallmouth fishing, and we'll be uh, uh, we'll be showing that over on the YouTube show, and uh, I'm excited about it. And we're we're going uh, just right now. We're ready to rock and roll. So. Uh, uh, I had Billy going. Billy's selling some dirt. You know, he's in the commercial real estate business, so I think he's got a closing. And he likes money, so he's going to get a check out of the deal. So a check overrides Pawpaw. So uh, he's going to stay home. And uh, I'm Pawpaw, by the way. I'm not a, I'm not a lipless crankbait, but I, I am Pawpaw. That's, that was the name of the bait. But nevertheless, Billy is going to stay back. But I'll get Hank Jr. and Boone and Cade. Awesome. All right, next question is Ralph Turner. If you could relive one tournament that – hold on. If you could relive one tournament that you won, which one would it be? Also, if you could go back to a tournament you lost, which one would it be? Oh man, I can tell you, I uh, I uh, I won the Super Bass tournament, and that gave me the uh, the Grand Slam title. And I lost that same tournament that would have given me that Grand slam title the year before on Lake Lanier and I lost it by one ounce to Gary Klein. I lost the superstar tournament to Denny Breyer by one ounce in Peoria, Illinois on the Illinois River. But the one tournament that haunts me the most that I lost uh, is the superstar tournament uh, the second year. I lost the first year I finished second to Denny Breyer by one ounce. The second year, I lost to O.T. Fears by 15 ounces. And uh, I think about that tournament more than – there wasn't anything I could have done different in the tournament that I lost by one ounce to Denny. Uh, I did the best I could do. I didn't do well on the first day, and then the second and third day, I caught the biggest stringer both of those days and came up one ounce short. But the OT uh, victory, which uh, let me tell you something, OT's an awesome fisherman. He deserved to win that tournament, and uh, I'm proud for him. I don't resent anything that OT did. He did a fantastic job. Uh, but he did catch a giant bass at the locks coming back in, and he culled, and that is the one fish that beat me. 
I came back early because I thought I had that tournament won. I could not see anybody coming back and beating me. I really felt like I had it won. I had a big stringer. I had a lead, and I thought it was my tournament. And I came back because I didn't want to risk getting caught in the locks and not making the way in. I came back two hours earlier. So I gave up two hours of fishing, and I weighed in a bass that weighed a pound and three quarters, and I feel surely had I spent the next two hours, I could have culled that fish. Now, whether I would have culled it and gained 15 ounces, I'm not sure, but there was a good chance of that. And it's a possibility I could have culled two fish and gained that 15 ounces and won that tournament. So I feel like that was my mistake. I left something laying on the table because I really felt like I had that tournament won. So that was my bad, and that is the one tournament that bothers me. The tournament I lost to Gary at Lake Lanier by one ounce was really nothing I could have done about that tournament. I did my best. Uh, nothing I could have done when I lost to Denny by one ounce. But when I lost by 15 ounces to OT, I felt like I left it laying on the table. It was my fault. Mm. So I, I regret that tournament. Mm. All right, next question. Bruce Baker, do you have any fishing goals or dreams left? Do I have any fishing goals and dreams left? I do have. I have a lot of uh, of of dreams uh, and that is to catch a big bass uh, uh, and have fun so uh, I am not uh, I'm not competitive by nature at this point in my life I have uh, I have outgrown that <clears throat> the Bible says when I was a child I spake as a child but as I got older I gave up childish things so <clears throat> I got to clear my throat I apologize I don't know why that does that to me but nevertheless I have dreams left to go fishing and uh, take my grandkids. You get too excited <clears throat> over there. I'm too excited, <laughs> yeah, that's it. But uh, my goal is to be a mentor uh, to a lot of high school fishermen, including my own grandkids. That's a big deal to me. So that's my dreams for the future is to be a mentor and be a good role model. I'd like to be a good role model. You know, fishing is so incredibly important as part of my life. <clears throat> but the most important thing in my life is Jesus Christ. And I'd like to be able to reflect that to my grandkids under fishing pressure. You know, Boone wants to be a tournament fisherman. So I want him to uh, uh, see me in uh, an adverse situation as a fisherman and still uh, being able to have a testimony for the Lord. So that's that's kind of my dream and goal for the future. Awesome. So tell me a little bit about summertime fishing. Summertime fishing. That's where we are for parts of the country. You know, it's, uh, it's easy when you live in one location to think that that's where the whole world is. And so you say, okay, we're now into summertime fishing. Well, no, we're not. <laughs> we're not in Canada. We're not in New York. We may not even be in parts of Pennsylvania and, uh, and north and maybe not in Washington or the extreme west. So depending on where you are, we're moving in to summertime fishing. And if you're in the south, you're pretty much in the middle of the beginning of summertime fishing. I learned a lot. Man, it was a learning process on the transition between spring and summer. I loved spring fishing. And I just kept right on fishing in the early summer as if it were spring, and I'd catch maybe a few stragglers. But I was missing the mother load. I was missing the majority of the fish, and I didn't even realize that. So as a kid... Uh, I was able to fish with a lot of people that had a lot more experience, and they turned me on to summertime fishing that I knew nothing about. I had no earthly idea that fish would migrate off points to get on underwater islands, mm. get on the outside of structure. Man, that was all foreign to me. And so I'm sitting there. I'm a bank beater. I'm fishing brush piles. I'm fishing stumps. I'm fishing all these little rock points and all this stuff. And the fish are all out here 200 yards away from where I'm at. And I didn't know that. 
So as a kid, I started learning because I fished with James Galloway. Uh, I fished with a guy named Larry Presley, who was awesome uh, uh, structure fisherman. Uh, I fished with a gentleman named Woody Wooten. Uh, I got to read about Blake Honeycutt and about Buck Perry and how they got offshore and how they caught fish out of deep water. And that was so foreign, but I had to learn that. Well, as I started putting those pieces together, I, I kind of learned the migration route. You know, these fish, you go to a spawning area. You say, well, how do you find these underwater places? Go to a good spawning area, a cove, a bay, where there's a lot of sandy bottom, where I was catching fish in the spring. Where is a natural migration route for those fish to go? Well, there's a long point out here, and that point leads to a little underwater island. So that would be the first place I would start to look. I would get off of that point, and I would find that little underwater island, and there's a really good chance those fish would be ganged up. And I didn't even know what that meant, you know, when I was a kid, because I would fish in the spring, and you go down a stretch of bank, you might catch four or five fish. Uh, on one stretch of bank, well, that was pretty good. But in the spring, uh, just scattered fish is pretty common. But in that early summer migration, when they leave those spawn of it, man, they gang up. And we pull out there and catch 25, 30 off of one spot. Man, that blew my mind. I had no idea anything like that existed. And, you know, we fish a little, Jack Chancellor made it famous, called it a do-nothing worm a little two-hook worm, and that started on Lake Wiley where I grew up. And uh, it was a Dr. Walker worm is what it was called. And you put a little egg ball sinker, and you tie a three-foot leader, and you tie that little worm. You sit out there and catch 30, 40 fish off of one spot. Now, we didn't have spot lock on our troll motors, and uh, uh, certainly water would have been too deep even if we would have had raptors or talons or, or poles. Uh, so we anchored. You pull out there and you drop an anchor, and you sit in there at one spot, man, and catch 30, 40 fish. So I learned that. And then as time went on, I learned that also as the summer goes on, my natural thinking is these fish go deeper mm -hmm. because it's hotter and the water will be cooler. Well, what actually happens for the most part in the south and then wherever it gets hot, there's a thermocline uh, where the oxygen below that thermocline is depleted, and so the fish actually stay above it. Mm -hmm. And that thermocline where I fished on Lake Wiley would move up to like 12 feet. So I think these fish is in the month of May, I'm catching them 25 and 30 feet deep. So I'm thinking in July and August, they're going to be 40 or 50 feet deep. Right. That's not true. They would be in 12 and 13 foot of water because that thermocline would be up there at 12 feet, 13 feet. So they get above that thermocline, and those fish are in shallower water in July than they are in May. At what point did you start to learn how to read the water and migration patterns? The one thing that I was able to do, I had this dream of being a pro fisherman. And I went to, I fished a tournament in 1975. Uh, uh, Butch Harris Lure Company contacted me and wanted to sponsor me because I had done so well uh, in 1974 in the Santee Cooper Open. And the BASS tournament was coming to um, Santee Cooper in 1975. And so Butch Harris Lure Company out of Charlotte, North Carolina, contacted me. They furnished me with a boat and paid my entry fee to go fish Santee Cooper. And when I went to Santee Cooper... Uh, I was catching a ton of big fish in the swamps where I was pretty familiar with. Uh, and the day before that tournament, they had four inches of rain. Mm -hmm. And it flooded the swamps, blood, mud, and a lot of current. Well, it was summertime. So I was not really very versed at summertime fishing. I was a big spinnerbait fisherman, and I was up in that swamp catching them on spinnerbait. And I feel like I could have blown that tournament away. I really, Roland ended up winning that tournament out of the lower lake, out of Lake uh, Moultrie. There's two lakes that make Santee Cooper, Lake Marion and Lake Moultrie, and, and Roland won that tournament. Uh, 
fishing a jig and spoon, I believe, uh, in Lake Moultrie. But I, f I could have blown that tournament away based on what I was catching in practice had it not rained all that flood. Well, saying all that, it put me in a situation where I had to go out and, uh, and fish summertime patterns, and I wasn't that good at it. I wasn't familiar. I didn't really know what to do. To be completely honest, I was lost. And as I fished that tournament and I watched these guys, I fished with a guy named uh, Glenn Wells from Greenbrier, Tennessee. And, uh, man, he could read the water. And he knew what summertime fishing was all about. And I didn't. And I realized I was not in the same league as Glenn Wells. Hmm. I was not capable of competing against the guys on the bass circuit in the summertime condition. Mm. So I came back and I started fishing Lake Wiley. Now I worked for Mike Hovis who owned Angler's Alley at Seven Oaks Marina. And I would, one week I would open the store at, at daylight and I would get off at noon. That week I would fish from noon till dark. Mm. The next week we would rotate and I would work from noon to dark. So I would fish from daylight till noon. So every week, don't let me put you to sleep now. <laughs> no, trust me, you're not. It's, okay. it's, it's a season. Right. I don't want to put you to sleep. So I fished every week. Every weekday I fished. And I would be out there all by myself. And I realized after that Santee Cooper tournament, I needed to learn. And I realized I was missing a lot. I wasn't versatile. I didn't know how to fish a grub. I didn't know how to fish a deep diving crankbait. I didn't know how to fish a jigging spoon. I didn't know how to do a lot of things that it took to be competitive. So I would go out and purposely say, today I'm going to catch fish uh, on a grub. I'm going to catch fish. And man's had a little bait called a stingray grub. He put it on a lead head, and I learned that bridge pilings was a very productive place for that particular bait. But I started looking at my depth finder, and I could see this line. I didn't even know what it was. And uh, I, I started reading, and I found out it was the thermocline. And then I, I read that the oxygen below that thermocline was insufficient for, for fish to live, so they rose above it. And so I started putting that together, and I'd go to these points, and I'd say, okay, the thermocline's and I'd start hitting these stumps. The thermocline's 13 feet. I'd start hitting these stumps out there with my little Carolina uh, uh, Dr. Walker two-hook worm. And uh, I'd start hitting these stumps in 10, 11 foot of water, and that's where they were ganged up. Hmm. They were not out there deep like I thought they were. Right. They, they, so I learned that on my own, and I learned it because I had all this time to expand, and I knew I needed to be versatile. I knew I needed to learn how to fish different baits, and I had to 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 learn how to be a summertime fisherman. So that's how all that came about. So I learned it on my own with reading articles about thermocline and picking up as much as I could from other anglers, from James Galloway and and uh, Roy Stowe and some of the old timers that I fished with that were so good at that. I learned from them, and also I learned so much of it just being out there on the water every day by myself trying to become a better fisherman, not being content with doing what I knew to do. I would purposely not fish the methods and techniques I was familiar with, but I would learn to do different and new things, and that's how I picked up on summertime fishing. That's pretty good. So always ask yourself why, be teachable, and push yourself for uh, to be better than what you are. So, and that that is the whole that is the whole thing about sharing methods and techniques and philosophies. So many people did it with me, and they helped me. So I try to do that. In the old days, we didn't have mass media, we didn't have television, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have YouTube, we had none of that. So the only opportunities you had to learn was one-on-one -on -one with individuals, and mm -hmm. these guys were so kind to me, and I'm so appreciative of their friendship. They've all, that I mentioned now, have passed on, 
but uh, they helped me so much, and uh, I, uh, I want to help other people. And to summarize summertime fishing is um, uh, when that spawn is over, those fish start to migrate. Look for a creek bed, a long point from that, that spawning area to that first deep water break line. And that's where those fish are going to gang up. The very first national tournament I ever won, and pay attention to the water. Pay attention to what's going on. That's the one thing that uh, people sometimes that fish with me get aggravated because a lot of times when I'm in a, if I'm catching fish, I'm talking. Yeah. I'm like Jimmy Houston. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm going. But if I'm not catching fish, I'm not saying a lot. Mm-hmm. Because I'm really concentrating. What the heck's going on? What am I missing? Uh, and, and I'm trying to put things together. So pay attention to everything that's going on. The first national tournament I ever won, I was in New York. I was fishing uh, the body of water that I still love today, uh, the St. Lawrence River. And uh, I run Mercury Outboards. And those Mercury's, I'm telling you what, uh, I don't know why they don't make them tougher. I hit a rock pile that was two inches under the water at 60 miles an hour. That shouldn't have broke my boat. I mean, I, should, I think that would break most things, most motorized anything. Uh, I'm teasing. Mercury's <laughs> awesome. But I did. I, I ran uh, I ran uh, over a rock pile the last day of that tournament, and I knocked my lower unit off. And uh, so Mercury sent me a new lower unit, by bus from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin to Alexandria Bay, New York. Mm. So I had to wait on it. And so it got there on uh, on Monday. And so they put that lower unit on my boat on Monday. Well, the practice started for the Clarks Hill tournament on Sunday. Mm-hmm. So I missed practice. I missed Sunday and Monday. I drove all day Monday and got there late Monday night, and so I practiced Tuesday for just a few hours, Mm. and uh, I drew a partner that was catching fish uh, in Cane Creek, Uh, no, he's catching fish in Little River, South Carolina Little River, Clarks Hill is made up of, of, uh, divided by South Carolina and Georgia, Mm. and uh, it's called Strom Thurman Reservoir today, but it was Clarks hill at that particular time and uh i was catching fish he was catching fish up this creek on spinnerbait and so the first day i fished with him uh he uh he and i didn't catch any fish i mean it's noon i I went with him because i didn't practice he told me he was catching fish and i knew this guy by reputation was a good fisherman and uh so we got up there we weren't catching any fish and uh so I realized, man, we're going to bomb. We cannot stay in this creek and throw a spinnerbait all day. It's July. These fish should be out on ledges. Mm-hmm. Well, as we got to the mouth of the creek and we're looking out across the lake, I saw a shad trying to get away from a, a bass. And I just marked that in my mind, and I got on. It was in his boat. I got on his troll motor, and I went straight to where that bass. And I'm looking at my depth finder all the way, and I'm staying in about about five or six foot of water. All of a sudden, I go down to about 15 foot of water right before I get to where that bass was, and I cast. And uh, my plastic worm only sunk about three feet and hit the bottom. Well, I'm sitting in 17 foot of water at this point. Mm -hmm. So I threw up, and so as I start pulling that thing down the hill, boom, I get a bite, and I catch one. Well, we both, he and I both, we backed up and we anchored, and we sat right there in the bend of that river, And uh, he caught 27 pounds, and I caught 24 pounds. Wow. Right there in that one spot, they were ganged up. That summertime fishing, Mm. feast or famine. When you find them, you usually find uh, the mother load. You don't just find a straggler. You find them ganged up, and that's that's what we did. Well, that was the first national tournament I ever won. Mm. And I really won that tournament because I saw that shad trying to get away from a bath. Had I not seen that one shad, I probably wouldn't have figured that out. So it's little things that make big differences. 
You know, every time you talk to somebody about how to catch fish, they want you to tell them about a lure, Mm -hmm. a secret bait. If they had this bait, they're going to catch them no matter what. Right. That is not the way it works. It's where you put that lure that makes all the difference in the world. You know, I've had the privilege to be a part of uh, the Bassmaster Classic. I've had a privilege of being a part of the Forest Wood Cup and working with the uh, FLW guys and uh, and and the Major League Fishing uh, team. And if you go to the Bassmaster Classic and you're you're on the dock where all these fishermen are lined up and they examine your boat. They look in your live well. They make sure your aerators are working. They make sure your kill switch is hooked up and that you have your life jacket secure and before they release you, and then you go out. Well, standing on that dock, you look at everybody's rods and reels, mm. and they all have got the same lures. Now, it might be a different brand name, a different make, but for the most part, they've all got the same ro- ro- same Rods and reels. The same lures. Same, same lures. lures. Same lures. That's okay. Some of them are going to zero, and some of them are going to catch a big bag of fish. So mm-hmm. it ain't the lures that are magical. It's where you put those lures. It's the technique, the tactic. That's what's magical. So that's summertime fishing. You can fish the right bait where there are no fish and not get any bites. Right. So I can tell you about a magic bait, but if you don't put it where the fish are, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> You're not going to catch them. Right. So that's summertime fishing, and that's what people have to realize is you need to keep turning over rocks looking for a cricket, you know. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's what the, is, is these blue heron, man, they, they'll stay and they'll keep, and they'll keep turning over rocks, and they're looking, they'll find them a, they'll find them a little minnow here or there. Right. you got to keep searching, 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 searching. And when you find them, you, you usually find them. I mean, we're talking about a school of fish. And uh, so you catch them all in one spot. And that's, that's summertime fishing. So people get complacent just beating the bank a lot of times, catching a few stragglers, when the, the majority of the schools of fish, they didn't even fish for them. So I learned that early on. And there's still a lot of guys like that. There are a lot of the pro fishermen that really never did adapt to deep water structure fishing. Mm. They always stayed on the bank. And uh, so you miss out a lot by not following the, the patterns of summertime and realizing you're looking for schools of fish, not individual fish. Mm-hmm. So that is what my philosophy is on summertime fishing. I'm always looking to find that school of fish, and you try to analyze whether the water's falling or rising, mm-hmm. and... Uh, that's a big part of summertime fishing. Well, right. If you know the animal you're trying to catch well, you need to know its movements. It's the same, goes the same for hunting. You know, if, if you're trying to track a deer, for instance, you have to know its pattern, its behavior. What time of the year is it? Where are they going to be at? You know, what time of the day do they normally eat? I mean, that translates very well into fishing as well. It does. And uh, the, the there's a lot to... Uh, Structure fishing, there's a lot, lot to uh, the current plays huge roles. I, I wrote an article. Mark Soson uh, was a, um, a writer for Sports Field, and uh, I did an article once. I called Mark. You know, back in the old days, the only way you could get publicity is if you came up with an idea for an article for a magazine or if Bob Cobb at Bassmaster Magazine would contact you about doing an article in Bassmaster. And so you'd have to come up with your own ideas sometime to get, uh, to get some opportunities. So I called Mark Sosin one time. I actually called Uncle Homer Circle, who was the chief editor, and he, he turned me on to uh, Mark Sosin. And uh, I called Mark, and I said, hey, Mark, uh, I got an idea on doing an article. I fish Lake Wiley all the time, and you go out and catch them on Friday. You have to completely change up to catch them on the weekend." He said, do what? I said, the way you catch fish on the weekdays when they're pulling water Hmm. does not work on the weekends because they shut the the dam off. They're not pulling water, so you don't have that current, and the lake starts to back up, and the fish behave completely different. Hmm. 
So you have to use a completely de different technique on Saturday than you do on Friday. He said, get out of town. <laughs> I said, come on, brother. Come on, let me show you. So he and I fished on Friday. And you would get out off the points, and I'd love to find a place. And we did all this with paper maps. This was before Lake Master Maps. Mm -hmm. So you'd take a paper map, and I'd show him this little underwater island or this point that the, the, the actual end of that point or the end of that island would be downstream. Mm -hmm. I love to find those kind of places right. because then the current would be coming off, and fish always face the current. Mm -hmm. That's the way they hold their position. They face the current. So now I know off the end of that island, if I anchor out here and I throw my bait up on that island and drag it, the fish are going to be facing in the direction that I'm bringing the bait. They can see it, yeah, yeah. right in front of their face. Right, it, so it's more productive. Mm -hmm. So we go out and we fish all day on Friday, and boy, we caught a lot of fish. We, I used to be really good on Lake Wiley, believe that or not. I, I used to really catch them. I fished it all the time, and I knew that lake really well. And, man, we hammered them. So to show him and make my point, then on Saturday we go back and we had some of these places we caught 15, 20 fish off of one spot. And I was throwing a deep diving crankbait and I was throwing a Carolina rig plastic worm. And so I didn't say anything to Mark except we went right back and fished those same spots the same way. Mm -hmm. We didn't catch any fish. And he said, I can't believe that. Man, we killed them here yesterday. Where do you think they're gone? I said, oh, they're still here. He said, no, they're not here. We'd be kidding. I said, oh, no, they're still here. They're just up on the hill. What do you mean up on the hill? They're further up on the point. I said, watch this. So we turn around, and we get the boat, and we get up here in five and six foot of water, and we anchor, and we start throwing back into 15 or 20, whereas on Friday we were anchored out here in 25, throwing in 12 or 13, dragging it down, catching most of the fish 15 feet deep. So then we're now we're up on top of the top of the break and we anchor in five foot and we throw it here in 12 or 13 and we're catching fish in eight, nine feet. He said, what in the world? I said, Mark, the water's backing up. The current is in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Those fish are not ganged up now because the current's not swift enough. It's just a gradual backup. So they're now scattered all over this point. So they're out here just kind of grounding around, scrounging around, looking for something to eat, and they're not holding in that one spot because we lost our current. So that's the difference between Friday and Saturday. On Friday, there was good current. Mm -hmm. But now on Saturday, the demand for electricity is less, so they don't generate power, so they're not running the wheels at the dam, and so there is no current. Hmm. You say, how so do you figure all that stuff out? It's just... Practical time on the water. Fish relate to current almost in every situation. And current is one of the biggest factors on how to go about catching fish. Summertime is critical. How much current is there dictates whether those fish are going to be ganged up on that spot. Mm -hmm. If there is no current, they're going to be way more scattered. Right. And I have fished, I have fished, when you're fishing and you fished all morning long and you're fishing deep water structure and you're just not catching them. And that sun heat up, the demand for electricity comes on, and they all of a sudden start generating, and man, every point you stop on, they're biting. It's all because of current. And a lot of people neglect that. They overlook that. They don't understand that. So summertime fishing is all about how to get on those places where there's a mother load of fish and you fish the current because they're going to dictate where those fish are going to hold on that particular spot. And with today, with electronic mapping, I'm going to be honest. In the old days, I'd take a map, I'd take my hummingbird flasher, and I'd go up and down, up and down, up and down till I found that perfect little point, and I would throw a marker buoy. And I would mark the very end of that point and break line, and I'd catch fish. Mm -hmm. But it might take me two hours. It might take me ten minutes. But somewhere between ten minutes and two hours, I'd spend running back and forth with my flasher, my old hummingbird, to determine exactly where the point was. Now, with a Lake Master map, I don't even go over it. 
I pull straight up. I know exactly where I am. I'm looking at the icon of my boat. I'm looking at the, and I know exactly where that point is. Wow. It made fishing so much easier. It made finding that sweet spot so easy. And that is the difference between today and pulling out those old paper maps and try to triangulate uh, what, how to line up and get just right. Now I can sit there and look at my hummingbird Lake Master map and I'm dead on it. There you go. It changed everything. So summertime fishing is about finding that sweet spot, finding the, the school of fish and allowing the current. Always throw your bait upstream and pull it where the fish are facing that current. Hmm. If the water's backing up, then get up on the hill. And I know all of that. And we fished a tournament on Lake Wiley, and I fished a spot that I fished for a thousand times, and there's my buddy Larry Nixon sitting on that spot. Well, unbeknownst to Larry, I fished it 15 minutes before he got there. Hmm. And I fished it by staying on the outside, throwing up on the hill. And so Larry comes in with a big bag of fish. And I said, Larry, did you catch those fish at River Hills on that point? He said, I did. I said, you rascal, I fished that point. He said, mm-hmm. He said, and you fished it staying on the outside throwing in, didn't you? I said, I did. He said, well, I was on the inside throwing out. I was dragging up the hill. They're scattered all out there in seven and eight foot of water. Well, I knew that, but I forgot it. <laughs> I didn't practice it. So he caught a big string of fish doing what I knew to do, but I didn't do it. Yeah, funny. That's frustrating. <laughs> it is frustrating. It's funny how the lessons you learn the hard way, you don't forget them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that reminded me, uh, you got to do what you got to do mm -hmm. to catch fish. You can't get lazy. You can't just go back and fish without thinking. All right, what is going on? You can't go out and fish without paying attention. People say, well, how'd you find all that bait? The seagulls, the blue heron. Man, all those birds were in that bay. I knew the bait was in there. Mm -hmm. The birds wouldn't be there. They fish for a living. <laughs> yeah. Literally. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. So they're, they're not going to be there if the bait's not going to be there. So now I know the bait's there. Mm -hmm. Well, what does fish prefer? What did I tell you earlier? They prefer to eat. Food. Food. And cup. Mm -hmm. In that order. A lot of people get that wrong. They start looking, oh, look at that good-looking grass. I know there's going to be fish there. There will be fish there if there's food. Mm -hmm. Now, there's usually a lot of food in grass because there's a lot of shrimp and little things in grass that people don't even know. They're snails, a lot mm -hmm. of things that fish feed on. But the shad and those heron, they move, and those fish move with them because that is their primary diet. Mm -hmm. Now, Say. if you're in the northern part of the country, it's gobies and elwy. Find the gobies and the LY, you're going to find the smallmouth or the largemouth, either one. Mm. I'll tell you what, some of those videos that I've seen, it's like uh, they'll put a camera in the water and the bass is just attacking anything and everything. You know, they'll eat whatever moves. That's my kind of place. <laughs> I like finding those. We, we always say, I, like, I need to find a big school of dumb fish. Yeah. And as I look for that, sometimes you find them. It's pretty mm. rewarding when you do. You think, <laughs> oh, I'm special. I'm great. <laughs> That's funny. Makes you feel good. But summertime fishing is, uh, is upon us. It's a fun time to fish, and people say, boy, it's too hot and muggy today. Those are the best days to fish. Boy, you get them old dog days, and it's so hot you can't breathe, man. The humidity, and you're just pouring sweat. That, those are some of the most productive days. So don't, don't wait on a cool front because those are hard days, man, when that little cool breeze blows in and those old clouds, puffy clouds get up there about a mile high and the humidity goes down. Uh, man, it's comfortable. Man, those are tough days. It's when those clouds are low and it's so hot and humid and muggy. Man, that's the good days. That's the days they bite. And one thing that I will add that I do in summertime fishing that I don't want to overlook is I usually go way up the river and go in these tail races where they're releasing water. Mm -hmm. I like to fish that swift water. And uh, uh, a lot of times you'll go in the morning and they won't be running water. They won't be generating. There will be no current. 
But if you'll hang around until that temperature warms up a little bit and that demand for electricity goes up, they turn those wheels on, it gets exciting. It can be very, very productive. So I like to fish current. Uh, I generally, uh, the more narrow a river or a lake is, the more effect the current has. I was always had the reputation of going to the river area of all these lakes, and people would ask me at different outdoor riders in interviews, why do you always gravitate to the northern end of the lake? Now, that's not true with Kentucky Lake of the St. Lawrence or the St. John's because they run backwards. Mm. <laughs> they flow from south to north. So it's the opposite. But why do you always go to the headwaters uh, of these lakes? Well, the more narrow the channel, the more effect the current has. So that current was the key for me catching them. So I want to go where I get the benefit of the most current. Mm. And so I would go to the narrower part of the lake. And a lot of times you'll go, the Tennessee's famous for this, a lot of the Tennessee River lakes. Uh, there'll be certain sections that's between two mountains or canyon uh, that get more narrow than the rest of, like, Gunnersville's got a lot of these places. Uh, Chickamauga's got a lot of them. Uh, and where it narrows down, the current's more swift. And so I would fish those areas more than I would the wide open area because I get more benefit from the current. It helps me read and figure out exactly where the fish will be. So I hope it's not confusing, but summertime fishing is a wonderful thing. It's a great time of the year to be on the water. you got to watch out for all the jet skis. People say, how fast will your boat go? I don't know. I don't go wide open anymore. <laughs> I'm too old. But I'm going to tell you, with these kids on these jet skis, you got to be careful. So I like to cruise around and uh, – and, and be safe. Don't, don't run over them. Share the water. Be, be careful because it, it is a crazy time of the year. These little jet skis will come out of nowhere and they turn on a dime. So you can't predict where they're going to go. And so I just always kind of creep down the lake. And that is the one hazard of summertime fishing. You got to watch out. Uh, jet skis will get you. But uh, nevertheless, it's a wonderful time to be on the water. Current is a big factor. And look for a group or a gang or a school or the mother load. Don't look to catch one or two stragglers. Get offshore. Uh, use your maps and uh, uh, your electronics to locate those hills and points further out in the lake. Get off that bank and uh, go to where the fish are. And uh, you'll catch a lot more where they are than you will if you go where there's just a few stragglers. I promise you that. Good times, summertime fishing. Good times. I think that's some very good advice. I learned some stuff that I didn't know. So uh, slot that away for when we go fishing Well, next. your <laughs> philosophy on summertime fishing is wear a bathing suit and put on uh, sunblock and a good book. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> a real good book. A real good book. That sounds like a, my type of <laughs> yeah. summer day. Well, that's okay. I, I understand that, and it, it's a lot of fun for me to fish while you read the book. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's talk about real quick before we end. Here we you go. always told me you can't talk on the boat; it's going to scare the fish. I have come to find out you only told me that just because you didn't want to hear this. <laughs> you want to hear me talking. The Bible says, be careful, your <laughs> sins will find you out. So uh, I have been busted. I've been <laughs> caught. I'll have to confess, your talking didn't bother the fish. It just bothered the fishermen. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's all good. It's about family fun and the outdoors. I hope you enjoy summertime fishing. Good time to have a cookout. Good time to enjoy the water, the lake, and uh, uh, catch fish in the process. So I hope this helps you out just a little bit. And what you have to say, Sarah Beth? I say goodbye. See you guys next week. All right. And I'll say goodbye. God bless you. And I'll see you next time. I'm Hank Parker. The house needs painting. Grass needs mowing. Where's he at? Hi, this is Hank. Sorry I missed your call. Leave me your name and your number and I'll get back to you. He's gone fishing. <laughs>